Well, we're going to start a new book tonight. We finished 1st and 2nd Samuel. And uh, we're going to flow right into 1st Kings. 1st and 2nd Samuel dealt with Saul and David. 1st <coughs> Kings deals with Solomon the wisest man that ever lived first kings now there is a transitional period here before Solomon takes over as king of Israel David is still alive but he's now very very old I believe he's bedridden, but he's still the king. So let's read chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Now, King David was old, advanced in age, and they covered him with cloths, but he could not keep warm. You ever feel like that? You just can't get warm? So a servant said to him, let them seek a young virgin for my Lord the king and let her attend the king and become his nurse and let her lie in your bosom that my Lord the king may keep warm. So he needed another warm body <coughs> to keep him warm. They found a young woman to keep him warm at night. So they searched for a beautiful girl throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishai, the Shulamite, and brought her to the king. The girl was very beautiful, and she became the king's nurse and served him. But the king did not cohabit with her. So nothing sexual is going on here. She becomes his nurse. She keeps him warm at night. She's like a heating blanket for him. She's beautiful, she's young. And she helps him. She's his nurse. Now, here's my question to you. Why did they have to go find another warm body to keep him warm at night? He had eight wives. And he did have concubines. Look at 2 Samuel 3. 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 2. Sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Ammon by Ahinoam, that's one of his wives, the Jezreelitess, and his second, Kiliab, by Abigail the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, the third, Absalom, the son of Micah, the daughter of Talmi, king of Geshur, and the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, and the fifth, Shef Shephetel, the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ethrim, by David's wife Egel, these were these were born to David at Heb Hebron. I think that's eight women right there. <clears throat> he had eight wives. Not only that, but Second Chronicles three, Second uh, First Chronicles three. <coughs> Verse 9, and he, uh, it lists more sons 
Verse 9, all these were sons of David besides the sons of the concubines. So David had eight wives that we know of. He had concubines, were kind of a lower level wife. Why did he have to go get a young teenager to keep him warm with all these women, all these wives? How come one of them could not have gotten in bed with him and kept him warm? Just a question. I think this speaks to the danger of polygamy. David was a polygamist. He had multiple wives. That was never God's original intention. He made Adam and Eve. He didn't make Adam and Eve and a bunch of other women. <coughs> he made one man, one woman. That was his ideal. Polygamy came into the scene David had multiple wives, and the danger is he couldn't, none of them would sleep with him. None of them would keep him warm. They had to go find somebody else to come in and keep him warm. Why didn't any of his wives help him? Now, I don't know if there's just cultural things going on that we're not aware of, but when you have multiple wives, none of them like you. They're all angry. They're jealous. They don't trust you. That's just the way it works. They don't want to help you. So that, that's the danger of polygamy. So now obviously we are not polygamous now. But there always is a temptation to have multiple partners don't do it you have a wife love her attend to her give her all your loyalty all your attention maybe when you're an old man she'll keep you warm if you've been loyal to her so David is an old man he can't stay warm at night like many older people, so they they got him a nurse. So he's having a hard time being the king. <coughs> he has health issues. And he also has a son. First Kings 1, verse 5. Here's another challenge to Solomon. We're trying to figure... We're trying to get Solomon into the kingship, but there are some challenges. Challenge number one, David is old and can't take care of himself. Challenge number two, Solomon had a brother, an older brother by the name of Adonijah. Verse five. Now, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. So he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen with 50 men to run before him. That, it, didn't his brother do that? Didn't Absalom do that? Look what happened to Absalom. So Adonijah is saying, I will be king. I'm next in line. Remember the, remember the prior brothers. The oldest son of David was Ammon. Ammon. He got killed by Absalom because he violated his sister. And then there was Kiliab. Nothing is known about him, so maybe he died as a young man. Then Absalom. He got killed as well. Next is Adonijah, this young man right here. The one that said, I'm going to be king, I'm next in line. But David had declared that Solomon would be king. Solomon was younger than Adonijah. So Adonijah 
claims the throne. I will be king. Bold, brash. He declared it. Then he worked on his public image by providing chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. 50 bodyguards, chariots and horsemen. He worked on his public image. And then he, he got a couple very powerful men to be his advisors. Verse 7. Oh, by the way, Adonijah, it says, and he was also very handsome man. And he was born after Absalom. He was a very handsome man. And then he, he gets very powerful men to, to back him up. He had conferred with Joab, the son of Zariah, and with Abathar, the priest. And following Adonijah, they helped him. So those are two very powerful guys to have in your pocket. Joab was the general of the the armies. Abathar was a high priest. Those two got behind Adonijah and said, we support you. We support you. Verse 9, look at his initiative. Adonijah, he just took the throne. <clears throat> he didn't confer with David. David's too old. Verse 9, Adonijah said, I'm going to jump on it. I'm going to claim it. I'm not going to confer with my father. He's too old anyway. He can't even keep warm at night. Uh, I'm just going to claim the throne. Verse 9, Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fatlings by the stone of Zoheleth, which is beside in Rogel. And he invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants, but he did not invite Nathan the prophet because Nathan was loyal to David. He didn't invite Nathan to the party. He did not invite Benaniah, the mighty men. He didn't invite those guys either. And he didn't invite Solomon, his brother, who was his rival. So he has a big service. And he invites everybody but Nathan and Benaniah and the mighty men and Solomon. He doesn't invite those guys. He invites everybody else and he sacrifices sheep and oxen and, and fatlings. He's declaring himself to be the king. And it works. <coughs> it works for a while. And they declare Adonijah to be the king. Now, David, in verse 8, has some loyalists. Zadok, the priest, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, Nathan, the prophet, Shimei, Ray, Shimei, Ray, and the mighty men who belonged to David were not with Adonijah. There's another contingency. David had these loyal men, the mighty men. They were loyal to David. They didn't follow Adonijah. They knew that Solomon was the, was the heir. So in verse 11, Nathan, he goes and speaks to a very powerful woman, Bathsheba. Because Bathsheba's son was Solomon. Nathan the prophet spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Have you not heard what Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king? And David our Lord does not know it. So now come, please. Let me give you counsel and save your life and the life of your son Solomon. Because had Adonijah become king, Solomon would have been killed. Because he's an heir. 
and Bathsheba would have been killed. Verse 13, go at once to King David. Say to him, have you not my Lord, O king, sworn to your maidservant, saying, surely Solomon, your son, shall be king after me? He shall sit on my throne. Why then has Adonijah become king? Behold, while you were still there speaking with the king, Nathan says, then I will come and confirm your words. So Nathan said, here's the plan. Very important. Bathsheba, go in there, talk to the king. Let him know what's going on. And then I will come in and I'll confirm everything that you have just said. And we will convince the king to do something. <coughs> so Bathsheba, verse 15, she, go, she went into the king in his bedroom. The king was very old. Abishai the Shulamite was ministering to him. Then Bathsheba bowed, prostrated herself before the king and said, he said, what do you wish? And she said to him, my Lord, you swore to your maidservant by the Lord your God, saying, surely your son Solomon shall be king after me and shall sit on my throne. Now behold, Adonijah is king. And now my Lord, the king, you do not know it. He has sacrificed oxen, fatling, sheep in abundance and has invited the all the king's sons and, and she relates she relates to him all that had been happening so this is very critical drop down to verse 32 then king david said call to me zadok the priest nathan the prophet benaiah the son of jehoiada and they came into the king's presence, and the king said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and have my son Solomon ride on my own mule, and bring him down to Gihon, and let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there as king over Israel, and blow the trumpet, and say, Long live King Solomon. So, Adonijah is doing his thing over here. His sacrifices, and he declared himself to be the king. But now, Solomon comes to another location, close to where Adonijah is doing his service. But Solomon is riding on the king's own mule, signifying that He's the king's choice. He's riding on the king's mule. And he has behind him Nathan the prophet and Zadok the priest and Benaniah the son of the, the Benaniah this mighty man. So now you have two groups. Two groups. And everybody, because they saw Solomon ride on the king's mule, they followed him. They followed him. He must be the real heir. The real heir. Because he, he's driving up in the king's suburban. That's David's car. So Solomon becomes the king. He's anointed, and he becomes the king. So now, there's a lot of unfinished business. All these transitions are always messy in the ancient world, even, even uh, now. <coughs> even now. Transitions of power are always messy because the one that didn't win doesn't want to acquiesce and doesn't want to submit. So there is rebellion to be dealt with. Look at, drop down to verse 49. Then all the guests of Adonijah were terrified. Hey, we picked the wrong guy. 
we hitched our wagon to the wrong horse. We all got behind Adonijah. Now they're terrified. Why? Because Solomon is going to, he's going to arrest us all and kill us. They were terrified. And they rose, each went his own way. Adonijah, he realizes the jig is up. He's not going to be king. He's afraid of Solomon, his brother. He arose and went and took hold of the horns of the altar. There in the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offerings had horns built into the corners. And Adonijah runs and takes hold of those horns of the altar. That was a holy place and a place of refuge for fugitives. It was a place where you were granted asylum. As long as you clung to the horns of the altar, you could not be harmed. <coughs> so, Adonijah clinging to the horns of the altar. Now, it was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon. For behold, he has taken hold of the horns of the altar, saying, Let the king swear to me today he will not put his servant to death with the sword. Solomon said, If he is a worthy man, not one of his hairs will fall to the ground. But if wickedness is found in him, he will die. So King Solomon sent and they brought him down from the altar and he came and prostrated himself before King Solomon and Solomon said to him, go to your house. He had mercy on him. <clears throat> For now, he, he messes up later. So Adonijah is dealt with. He begs for mercy. He clings to the horns of the altar. Now, there's some unfinished business that needs to be attended to. Unfinished business, chapter 2, verse 1. As David's time to die drew near. This is great right here. He charged Solomon, his son, saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. Everybody dies. I'm dying. My son, be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Be a man. Be strong. Be faithful. Be a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn. So he's giving him a charge. To obey the word of God. His commandments, ordinances, testimonies. Keep the law of God. And you will be a success. You will succeed in all you do and wherever you turn. So that the Lord may carry out his promise which he, which he spoke concerning me saying. If your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart, with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So he gives them the charge. And then he gives him some interesting assignments. He said, basically, Solomon, in my life, I did not execute judgment on certain people, but you will. You're going to take care of my unfinished business. 
There's this guy named Joab. That was David's general who got away with a lot of stuff in his life. Verse 5. Now, you also know what Joab, the son of Zariah, did to me. What he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner, the son of Ner, to Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed. He also shed the blood of war in peace. And he put the blood of war on his belt and around his waist and on his sandals, on his feet. He was a bloody general. He was loyal to David. He was insubordinate at times. And he was cruel. Verse 6, So act according to your wisdom and do not let his gray hair go down to Sheol and peace. Kind of reminds you of the Godfather. <clears throat> I want you to kill him for what he did. How he behaved himself. Now how come David didn't have him killed when he was alive and strong? <coughs> well, Joab was powerful. He was the general of the armies of Israel. It would not have been prudent to have killed Joab at that time. But David tells Solomon... I want you to do it. I want you to execute him. So he does. That was unfinished business. Verse 7. Then there's the case of. But show kindness to the sons of. Barzili. The Gileadite. And let them be among those who eat at your table, for they assisted me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. I want you to bless the family of that great man. I want those people to eat at your table. I want you to honor them. And then there is Shimei. Behold, there is with you Shimei, the son of Gera the Benjamite, now, it was he who cursed me with a violent curse on the day I went to Mahaim. Mahanaim. But when he came down to me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. Now, therefore, do not let him go unpunished. For you're a wise man, and you will know what you ought to do to him, and you will bring his gray hair down to Sheol and death. Remember that guy Shimei? He was cursing David, throwing dirt on him. And David said, leave him alone. Leave him alone. Maybe God is telling him to do that to me. But David tells Jonathan, I want you to take care of him too. Unfinished business. Unfinished business. Well, David dies. Verse 10. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. He died. And he slept with his fathers and he was buried. The days of David reigned over Israel were 40 years. 40 action-packed years of war and building and intrigue setbacks, family conflicts. Forty years, seven years he reigned in Hebron. Thirty-three years he reigned in Jerusalem. And Solomon sat on the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. He had gotten rid of all his adversaries. He was now firmly entrenched. He was the king. He was the king, firmly established. Now, Adonijah was still alive. <clears throat> Adonijah was still alive. He, he's the one that got he, hanging onto the horns of the altar. And David pardoned him. Not David, uh, Solomon showed mercy 
to Adonijah. But Adonijah, he messed up. David did not execute him. He could have. Look at what Adonijah did. You see, some people just... <coughs> they don't learn their lesson. He could have lived a nice, productive life as David's brother. He could have served his brother. David had pardoned him, had showed mercy to him. He didn't learn his lesson. Verse 13, Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. And she said, Do you come peacefully? And he said, Peacefully. Then he said, I have something to say to you. And she said, Speak. So he said, You know that the kingdom was mine, and that all Israel expected me to be the king. However, the kingdom has turned about and become my brothers, for it was his from the Lord. Now I am making one request of you. Do not refuse me. And she said, Speak. He said, Please speak to Solomon the king, for he will not refuse you, that he may give me Abishai, remember the young nurse? The Shulamite as a wife. And Bathsheba said, very well, I will speak to the king for you. <clears throat> Ask my brother if I could have Abishai as my wife. Now Abishai was David's wife, the king's wife. This was a very dangerous request. It cost him his life. Let's read on. So Bathsheba went to the king to speak to him for Adonijah. She didn't realize all the ramifications of this request. And the king arose to meet her, bowed before her, sat on his throne. Then he had a throne set for the king's mother, and she sat on his right. Then she said, I am making one small request of you. Do not refuse me. And the king said to her, Ask my mother, for I will not refuse you. So she said, Let Abishai the Shulamite be given to Adonijah, your brother, as a wife. King Solomon answered, said to his mother, And why are you asking, and why are you asking Abishai the Shulamite for Adonijah? Ask for him also the kingdom, for he's my older brother. David saw right through the ruse. Adonijah was, da was Solomon's older brother. If he was able to marry David's young wife, it would elevate his status in the eyes of all the people, and he could claim to be the heir again. That was his agenda. Solomon saw right through it. Verse 23, Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, May God do so to me and more also if Adonijah has not spoken this word against his own life. Now therefore, as the Lord lives, who has established me and set me on the throne of David my father, and who has made me a house as he promised, surely Adonijah shall be put to death today. And he was executed. <clears throat> Adonijah was a foolish man. <clears throat> he tried to be king. It didn't work. He was given mercy. And he tried again. And he was executed. He had to go. He would be a thorn in Solomon's side. He would be... He would always be ambitious. He could never be trusted. He had to go. He had to go. Now, here's another 
character, verse 26, that had to go as well. Then to Abathur, the priest, the king said, he didn't want to execute him. He was the priest that took Adonijah's side. David didn't want to execute him though, but he had to go somewhere far. Go to Anathoth, to your own field, for you deserve to die, but I will not put you to death at this time because you carried the ark of the Lord God before my father David and because you were afflicted in everything with which my father was afflicted. So Solomon dismissed Abathar from being, from being priest to the Lord in order to fulfill the word of the Lord which he had spoken concerning his, the house of Eli in Shiloh. So what's that, what's that about? Remember Eli and his two sons? God judged them and said that the priesthood will be taken from your line, from your lineage. Well, Abathar was of the line of Eli. By dismissing Abathar, it was a fulfillment of the promise made Probably at least a hundred years prior. God is patient, but his word always comes true. So this priest was stripped of his priestly duties and sent home. Sent home. A couple more, then we're going to stop. All this unfinished business. Joab is executed. Remember him? Joab is executed. Shimei, this guy that was cursing David. David gave, well, let's read it, verse 36. Now the king sent and called for Shimei and said to him, Build for yourself a house in Jerusalem and live there. I want to keep an eye on you. I want to keep you close. And do not go out from there to any place. For on the day you go out and cross over the brook Kidron, you will know for certain that you will surely die. I will let you live in the confines of Jerusalem. You got to stay here. If you cross over the brook, you're going to die. Well, guess what happened? He crossed over. He crossed over the brook, didn't take Solomon seriously. And, and he died. Verse 45, But King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So the king commanded Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and fell upon him, so he died. Thus, here's a conclusion. Thus the kingdom was established in the hands of Solomon. And Solomon would take this kingdom and would grow the kingdom farther than any other king of Israel. The boundaries of this kingdom would never be as great as it was during the reign of Solomon. He built a beautiful temple to the Lord. He became known all over the world as the wisest man. People would come with delegations. The Queen of Sheba, others would come to learn from this man. He had a navy. He had trade routes around into Africa, into Arabia. It was a, it was a great kingdom. It's never been matched in the history of Israel. Under Solomon, Israel achieved its height. But he had to first of all establish it. And what we just gave you today was the transition from David to Solomon. It wasn't easy. It wasn't smooth. There was a lot of opposition. A lot of people didn't want him. Adonijah being one of them. But God gave him the boldness and the wisdom to consolidate, to, to, to make this transition and to consolidate everything. 
And from here on in, it's all about Solomon and his reign. Solomon, by the way, wrote most of the Proverbs, the book of Proverbs. If you want to be really wise, read Solomon's Proverbs. Make you wise. So David is dead. He was buried. He sleeps with his fathers. Solomon is now in, he is entrenched. He is the king. And it's only up from here. But it didn't happen easy. So that's just a little bit of history for us. Well, let's bow in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. I encourage you to look at the table set up in the other room trying to help Nevaeh get to New York, I believe. We'll ask our usher to come forward. We'll take this evening's offering. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you and thank you, Lord, for the, the history of David and now Solomon. It is... Uh, Exciting to learn about the great men of the Old Testament. We pray now that you would bless tonight's offering. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.